If you can turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4 and read with me verse 7. But the end of all things is as hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Stop there, period. We will look at this one verse and expound upon it about the end times. You've probably heard people say, the world's coming to an end. Probably even watched some movies and how the world has come to an end by some disaster, some earthquake, volcano erupts, or some meteor is coming at the world and it's coming to an end, you know, something dramatic like that. You've probably even asked yourself, it seems like the world's coming to an end. And I just wonder, when is that going to happen? When will the end come? And so we all have that question. I know I've had that question in the past, looking at what's going on in the world today and just ask myself, Lord, you said you're, you're coming back. You said it's coming to an end. So when is that going to be? How much longer do we have? There was a man named, named Schwarzer. He was an accomplished musician, theologian, philosopher, and even physician, and a humanitarian. In his book, The Quest for Historical Jesus, which he published in 1906 in German, he painted Jesus and his early followers as being obsessed, obsessed with the very intimate return of Jesus and the world coming to an end. Since the world did not, in fact, end in the first century, that would seem to leave Jesus as deeply mistaken about his own mission. So, He's saying basically that he wrote about the fact that he, his disciples, wrote about the end of the world coming, and yet it didn't happen. And so it made Jesus look like a fool, and that he didn't understand even his own mission to coming to the world. And even today, people still live as though Jesus is not coming. It's been over 2,000 years since the birth of Christ, 2,500 years since the, um, the birth of Israel as a nation. And Christ has not come yet. Where's he at? What's he doing? And why hasn't he come? Did he say he was coming? And why hasn't it happened yet? Is he lying to us? Is there a reason that he hasn't come back? And we're going to look at those questions and hopefully answer quite a few of them today. Peter did not have this view. He is definitely teaching about the end of things coming to a persecuted church during a time of much suffering. And he was encouraging the church by proclaiming that the end of all things is at hand, so we need to be serious, watchful, and in prayer. Now, last week we looked at the context here in verses 5 through 6. And in fact, in verse 1, it talks about Christ's suffering and what he endured, and he even endured the cross. And so since he endured and he was faithful to God to accomplish his plan and purpose, so we also need to be faithful to the Lord, not to live a life of sinfulness, as he tells us in verse 3, that we should live a life separated unto God for his glory. And encouraging them along that lines, remember, as we're being persecuted, as Christ was persecuted, as we are suffering, as Christ was suffering, so the end of all things is coming. And so be watchful, be in prayer. So all things are coming to an end. Let's look at this verse and let's break it up as we get into it. Verse 7, but the end, let's stop there, the end. What does that word end mean? In the Greek it's telos. It's never used in the... New Testament as a chronological end. In other words, it wasn't a chronological event and then bam, it's over, it's done. Like much of the Hollywood movies will try to uh, portray that the world is coming to an end, annihilation, annihilation of people, everything, nothing will no longer exist, period. That's not what this word is talking about. This word is a consummation. It is a, a result of a certain goal. And that goal that Jesus has is that for this earth to end, but it will bring about a new earth, and all who believed and trusted in Christ will live upon this new earth for a millennium, and then from that point on, for eternity, we will dwell with God Almighty in the heavens. Doing what? I don't know. 
but I'm sure it will be fun doing it, and I'm sure that it will be exciting, and I'm sure that it will be totally different than what we are doing here on this earth. So he says, but the end of all things is at hand. The word hand means near. It's very near. The Greek word is exio, or egis, or angus, which means near, indicating intimacy. Not intimacy, but intimacy means immediacy, that it's coming very closely. The Greek suggests that the end of everything is a irreversible act that will take place upon this earth. So this statement that Peter gives us is interesting. In light of what he said earlier in chapter 3, verse 20, concerning Noah. Because Noah, in his time, brought about the judgment of God upon the earth. As he is speaking here, a judgment is coming when the end of all things is at hand. And you go back to that chapter, verse 20, and you see that he talks about Noah and the baptism of Noah while he was in the ark. Now, if we go to Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, this is what it says. God said to Noah... The end of all flesh has come before me. Now, when you go back there and you read the whole account, you'll know that the world was wicked. It was evil. And it cried out to God that God said, that's it, I've had enough. And so all flesh needs to be destroyed. God's judgment will come upon the earth. It's the first example of, or I would actually say the second example of God's judgment upon man. The first example was when man sinned, Adam and Eve, and he kicked them out of the garden. And he judged them that they would no longer live for eternity within that sinful state, but would die physically so that they could live spiritually with a new resurrected body in the end. And then comes along Noah, and you see God's judgment upon the earth through a flood. And then he gives a rainbow because he was saddened that he had to destroy man to remind them of the flood and that his judgment through flooding would never happen again. He continues on and he says, For the earth is filled with violence, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. If you can imagine a world of violence, well, we live in a world of violence today, but imagine a hundredfold of that violence, where it was violence constantly. So constantly that God says, I need to destroy man, at least they destroy themselves, along with Noah possibly. But he found Noah, and that Noah was faithful. We see this destruction of the world by this flood. And by the way, there's a movie coming out called Noah, with, um, what's his name, Russell Crowe. I encourage you to go see the movie. I don't necessarily agree with the theme of the movie. I've read some articles on the movie and and from what perspective it's coming. But it would be nice to go see it, invite somebody, uh, you know, a friend, a neighbor. Hey, let's go to the movies. Who would say no to that? You know, and take them to the movie Noah. And and then read the account in chapter 6 of Genesis. Get to know it and then fill in the gaps for them. Did you know the Bible does talk about this? You know, and this is what the Bible said and this is why the the, the earth was flooded and, and so forth and how it's interesting that we're living like the days of Noah. And you're able to witness to them. There's another movie coming out called Noah and it's by Ray Comfort, Living Waters. In fact, I have it downloaded on my iPad. I just have to figure out how to to uh, open it up, I guess, and then we can show it actually on the screen, which would be nice, and we can, we can kind of see the real account biblically, and then go see the movie, so I'm hoping to do that here real soon. So, we see this destruction of the world by a flood. The end is used here in chapter 4 of Peter, in a similar way, referring to the end of this present church age. We're in the church age, in that Jesus brought about the new way, the the way of grace, a new dispensation, and we call it the church age. Well, the end of that church age will be brought about when Christ returns to the earth for the second time. This statement of Peter comes at a time when the church is being persecuted. And I thought that was interesting. Here the church is being persecuted by the government, by the citizens, by Gentiles around the world. And Peter's reminding them, because Paul talked about it, Jesus even talked about it, that the world is coming to an end to encourage them. Now, I think it's interesting that they were being persecuted. And I'm wondering, could it be that we would see the second coming of Christ when the church begins to get persecuted again? 
So there could be a time where we, if the Lord is coming back, could go through some persecution. We're seeing a little bit of it, not much, but a little bit of it. We're not persecuted too bad. I mean, they're not taking us to jail. You go to Iran and you preach the gospel, you go to jail. And you'll probably be mistreated and sent to the hospital many times. But here in the United States, we don't see a lot of that. We're, we're actually prospering in this uh, church age for us, not persecuted. And so I'm just kind of wondering, if the end comes, will there be persecution upon the earth? You know, we, we just don't know. Let's turn to Matthew and let's look at Jesus' perspective of this. Matthew chapter 24, the first book in the Gospels. Jesus is speaking here in chapter 24. Um, the whole chapter pretty much is in red, which tells you that it's His words and that He is speaking. And in verse 36, He gives us this illustration of the days of Noah. And He says, But of that day, that is when the end comes or is near, an hour no man knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we know nobody knows the day or the hour. Jesus said it Himself. But yet, he gave us an example of what that day will be like in the next statement. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so if you go back to Noah and you read about it, you can get a picture of what it will be like in the end times. What are some of the things that that Noah endured? Well, the fact that evil was on the earth. We see it happening today. The fact that man's imagination was evil, the Bible says. And you think about what's going on today with technology and what the internet has brought into this world with pornography and all kinds of other garbage and gamings and various things that that are evil. Man's imagination has become evil and they're using this technology to spread that evil around the world. He goes on and he says in verse 38, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Another interesting thing, they were unaware of it. Though Noah was building the ark 120 years, I'm sure someone walked by, what are you doing, Noah? So you're like, why would he be doing that? The end of the world? Yeah, right. And then go on with eating, drinking, and marrying like nothing is happening. And we see that complacency within the church and within the world. We're not going to end. This world's not coming to destruction. I find it interesting that our government is preparing that. A lot of conspiracy theories out there, especially in Dallas Airport. I believe it's the Dallas Airport that's out there. They have these underground bunkers. They say there's all kinds of seeds. There's all kinds of foods and and things in these bunkers preparing for some doomsday of some sort. Uh, If you watch that doomsday channel... It's pretty interesting how they're all preparing for some doomsday, you know. So everyone's talking about it. And it's like the days of Noah where they're just eating, drinking, and complacent in life, marrying and going on with life. And did not know until the flood came and took them away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So it'll be like a thief in the night, as Paul puts it. We won't be aware of it. It will just happen and we're gone and we are out of here. Then he says, before the second coming, we have what we call the rapture. The word rapture is not used in the Bible, but the word caught up is, that we will be caught up in the air. From our bodies that are in the ground, they will be the first to resurrect and meet our souls in heaven, and we will put on this new body at the rapture of the church. He says this concerning the rapture in verse 40, Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. So you have these two guys, they're both in the field. One is taken and one is left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now that's an interesting picture. One of the events before the end times is the rapture. And we're waiting for the rapture to take place. Probably the only thing that has not been fulfilled yet that we're waiting for is the rapture of the church. When the trumpet of God sounds like an archangel, then the church, the believer, will be raptured up into heaven to meet Christ and the body. Now notice that when that happens, that there will be two men in the field. There will be two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and the other one will be left. Now it's interesting. 
observing that, you have two men working, two Jewish men, because it is a Jewish example by Jesus speaking to the Jewish people. Two Jewish men who understand the Old Testament, who understand the Torah, who understand who God is and so forth. They both have that education, and yet one is taken and one is left. They are both both doing the same thing. Same with the women. Both Jewish women grinding at the mill, doing the same thing. Why was one taken and one not? That's the question to ask. There are some scholars that believe that these people that are left behind are the ones that are not as committed as the others. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so they are left behind. Jesus does talk about goats and sheep within the church. You remember when he talked about within the church itself, there are goats and then there are sheep. He also talked about wheat and tares. There's the wheat that makes bread that is good for you, but then there's the tares, is that weed that grows within the wheat that's no good. He goes, and don't try to separate it because you might harm some of the wheat. Just wait till the end and God will remove the wheat and separate it from the tares. Taking of the rapture again. So could it be that, that there are believers who believe in God, who believe in Jesus Christ, who have an understanding in God, are left behind because of their life is not consecrated unto God? That's a possibility. Uh, Chuck says that it's a possibility. I don't think we can be dogmatic about it. Well, what do we do about that? Jesus said in John chapter 15, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. And so that's the key is to abide in Jesus Christ. And if you abide in Him, then you don't have to worry about being left behind. You know that you will go to heaven. You know that you have an eternal salvation. And you know that you won't be going through the tribulation period. Because those who are left behind will suffer through the tribulation period. Read Revelations chapter 4 and on, dealing with the tribulation period. It will take place upon this earth and then the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the day or the hour, we don't know, but we see the signs. We see the, the, the um, examples of what it will be like. Then he goes on and says, for encouragement here in verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming, but you know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not expect him. So be ready. Be watchful. Expect it. And be busy with what God has entrusted you to. Let me encourage you. Because I know that, that we're all at different places. Some of you might ha be having financial difficulties. Some of you might be sick. And you're suffering with an illness of some sort, and it's painful. And some of you might be suffering in other ways, you know, in your relationships and so forth. Would you just hang on? Just trust in Jesus. It's not going to be much longer. The Lord's coming back real soon. And so just put your faith in Him. Abide in Him. Trust in Him. Hang on to Him while you're waiting. Because when He comes back, you'll be raptured up to be with the Lord and spend eternity with God. Well, what happens before the end comes? What kind of events can we look for? I put a few together just to give you some examples, and there are many. And I want to talk about a few of them. Some of them are already taking place. Others have already been fulfilled. And yet we're still waiting for the rapture to take place. One of them is a one-world government, a one-world government, or at least a leaning towards one-world government needs to take place. We see that today, don't we? We see a one-world government taking place today. The Bible never uses the phrase one-world government, or it never uses the phrase one-world currency, which is a part of the one-world government. These are references and statements that we've come up with to explain this unity that will take place in the end times. The evidence is there to draw that conclusion, though. When you go to the book of Revelation, John sees a beast who's also called the Antichrist, rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Revelation 13.1. These 
heads and horns are actually nations that are rising there in Europe and becoming powerful nations. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verses 16 through 24, we see this one world system where this one head will become powerful and it will conquer the other nations and, and thus creating a one world system that will wage war against all Christians during the tribulation period. And so we see a picture of a one world government. We saw it in the Old Testament with the Tower of Babel and how all people came together and they were building this one world government. And God says, no, it's not what I want. And so he confused them. He changed their languages and they couldn't communicate with each other any longer. And so they had to disperse around. I know sometimes we, we get uh, hung up on cliques, you know, going to a church and being a part of a clique. You know, it's not all bad though. Well, wait a minute. I thought we're not supposed to have cliques. It's not all that bad. Because we don't always get along because of our personalities. And there's a reason for that. God wants to reach everyone, even the different personalities. Can you imagine if we all had the same personality? First of all, we'd all be dressing the same. You know, we'd all be talking the same. We get bored really easy, you know, because we're talking and speaking the same subject. And we all agree on everything. There would be no arguments and so forth. That's boring. You know, that is totally boring. I want a little excitement you know, our conversation, what do you believe, what do you lean towards, you know, it makes a little excitement, it's good to be different, it's good to be different, it's good, I'm not going to say completely, I mean, if you have a click and you belong to click, great, but don't isolate others that want to be a part of it, you need to reach out to, but there are people that have certain personalities that will meet with you, and you bring them in, and they become a part of your little group, you know, and you have other groups, and then all the groups come together, and they have a great time of fellowship, you know, there are people that I don't get along with, but I don't, you know, not like them or love them. You know, I'm not angry with them. We're just different. And, and so we don't have to have chicken together, you know, every night. We just, you know, love each other and yet respect each other. There's, it's not a big deal. And so we see this one world system coming. Uh, God doesn't want that. Uh, the currency that's used today the most is the dollar and the euro. And so this one currency is already taking place. It's either the dollar or the euro. And one day maybe the dollar is worth nothing and it's just the euro and everyone is using that. And then we have another, th another event. Israel returning to their land. Now this has already happened. You know, Israel was born 2,500 years earlier. And they, then they became a sovereign nation. On May 14, 1948, God, by His grace, granted them to return to their land and to become a nation once again. Listen to what Hosea said in 3.4. The children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince. Before 1948, Israel had no nation and they were dispersed across the world. They had no king, they had no prince at all to guide them or lead them. Without sacrifice, without pillars, without Ephraim, no religious system, no temple uh, to worship. They were nomads. Then it says in verse 5 of Hosea, Afterwards the children of Israel shall return and shall seek the Lord their God. Now there are two prophecies there. One is they shall return. And they did. In 1948, they returned back to a nation. And almost in a day, they were a nation once again. In returning to worshiping the Lord, that's another question. That's coming in the future. And during the tribulation period, Israel will return to the Lord and they'll acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. And that's coming in the future. Listen to what Isaiah said about Israel becoming a nation. Because that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Have you ever heard of the um, Amorites? Are there any Amorites here? How about Jebusites? No Jebusites? You know, these were nations that existed back then. They're gone. They no longer exist. Then you had the Israelites. They are still around. And now they are a nation and we call them Israel. And listen to what Isaiah said. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such a thing? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? And it's speaking about Zion, Israel. In a day, in a moment. Pretty amazing that God prophesied about this, you know, hundreds of years earlier. And here we are today, Israel, a nation. And of course, everybody hates them. And everybody around them 
does not like them. In fact, there are many in the church that don't like Jews. I remember when I was a kid, <clears throat> my family was so prejudiced to Jews. Now, you probably uh, heard some of the rumors that the Jews owned everything. They owned all the banks, they owned all the wealth, they owned everything in the world. That was a lie. Still is a lie. They don't own that much. You know, they're a small little nation sticking to themselves. Yes, many of them are blessed because God is good, but there's not a conspiracy for them to take over the world. It's, it, it's ridiculous. There's just this hatred for the Jews. And it is a part of the end time scenario because they will attack they will attack Israel. You've got your, your end times newsletter and it's about um, Russia getting closer to attacking Israel. They're now joining Iran and building a nu another nuclear power plant. And of course, they've just went into the UK, took over uh, a gas plant there, and they're just trying to, again, build their empire, show their muscles, and, and reveal that they're, once again, a nation that we need to worry about. And we know that they're in prophecy. So they're restored. And then there is the... Um, the increase in technology. The Bible tells us that in the end times that there will be this great advancement in technology. Listen to what Daniel said. Daniel said, or God said to Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Seal the book up until the end. And in the end, knowledge shall increase. Technology. It's amazing what this little phone will do. As Roman was reading the bulletin on a piece of paper, I was looking at it on the phone. You know, a, a, a PDF file, they call it. And he just saved the original into a PDF and then he emailed it and it went whoo, somewhere into the air and it came to my phone and boom, now I look at it and it's exactly like the paper. It looks exactly like it. That is amazing when you think about it. I remember being a little kid and watching Star Trek. You know, and the guys would go like, Ch -ch -ch, and they sit there and, Ch -ch -ch -ch, you know, putting in all those things. And I'm like, yeah, right, that will never happen, you know, and so forth. You know, and you're, now you're going Ch -ch -ch, all day long. You see everybody, and they're all on the, on the trains or in their cars, Ch -ch -ch, you know, texting, punching numbers and codes and doing banking. And I mean, every, your whole life is on here. This is how the Antichrist can keep track of you. GPS, right here. They know exactly where you're at. This phone is on. They know where you're at. I mean, it is amazing how technology has increased. I remember when it used to be a pager. Remember the pagers? You know, and you get a beep, 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 and you look, oh, i got to call the boss. You know, so now you got to drive. Where's a telephone booth? You know, where's a telephone booth? You know, and you finally find a telephone booth, and then you got to put a quarter in there, or they'd give you a card, and you had minutes racked up on it, you know, and you just punch in the numbers and you can, yeah, what do you want? You know, go do this job, okay. And then you beep, 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 like another one. And, and then they came out with phones that were this big, and so you're carrying it like this, you know, with a big old antenna, you know, what'd you say, what'd you say, hang on, what'd you say? And you can only go so far because it's plugged into your car, you know, can't move beyond that. And now they have these little phones that does everything. That is amazing. That is amazing. I looked up on the internet just to get some different ideas. What, what made me look this up was the fact that I saw this posting about a skateboard. And it was a, um, what do they call it? A saucer board. It, it repelled through a magnetic system and you could ride it without wheels and you were floating. And so I looked at it, and they were pretty good. They're floating around, riding and doing flips and things like this. I'm like, this is crazy. So I started looking it up, and it turned out to be a fake. That guy that was on um, Back to the Future, the older guy, he was actually uh, a part of the commercial. You know, and so I'm thinking, is this real? Is this really real? So I started looking stuff up. Did you know they have a flying saucer? And it's propelled by magnetic system. They really have one already. It's a, it's a small little replica, and it's a saucer, and, and it allows uh, air to flow into it, and, and it's got the flaps like planes, but it's a, around the whole thing. And it somehow uh, propels through a magnetic system and can move in different directions. It's crazy what technology has done. We were at Corky's the other day. They, they, they open you know, 24 hours a day, and the waiter, who likes to talk to us a lot, and we get every opportunity to share with him. He said, one night, 3 o'clock in the morning, we're all outside and we see this great light. 
And it's literally moving like this and going up and down. And he goes, I think it was an alien ship. You know, we're like, I don't think so. <laughs> well, probably a saucer, a government saucer a experiment or something like that. They're doing late at night. Oh, no, you don't believe in aliens? I go, no, I don't believe in aliens. The Bible does not talk about aliens. It talks about demons disguising themselves at, at, at different forces and signs and miracles. I go, and you have the problem with other worlds existing before Jesus' death. What about their sins? What about their atonement? There's a problem there. So I don't believe in other, other planets with people on it because the Bible does not talk about that. And I believe what the Bible says. It says, I believe in de- demons. I believe that our government probably has some ship. I saw... Another advertisement of a, an airplane that they're working with that, that is supposed to be better, faster than what we have today. So it is amazing what technology will do. Lasers. It is amazing what laser technology will do. I had some laser, what they called cold laser. It's infrared. And you can leave it on your body all day long. It won't do anything to you. But if you have inflammation and in cells that are dead and you rub this cold laser across it, for some reason, it causes those cells to move out of the way and it brings in new cells and it brings healing. And I've had it done on my hip and it's amazing. Almost overnight, you feel it without any complications at all. So technology, it has definitely increased. And then the last thing I'd like to share, uh, which I think is probably one of the most deceiving events that takes place, is that the fact that there's there's a great falling away of the church, what we call apostasy. Apostasy. The church, many churches out there, denomination, non-denominational, uh, old Presbyterian church, uh, Lutherans, and so forth, are falling away from the Word of God. They're no longer teaching from the Bible. We, we have a church right here in Eastvale. And they literally, on Sunday mornings, they will take the latest movie and they will talk about the movie and pull out spiritual truths from the movie. Yeah. The latest one was, what, what was it called again? Um, with uh, Sandra Bullock and huh? Gravity. Gravity. They'll take that movie Gravity and they'll pull out truths. And that's their Sunday morning message. And of course they only go 30 minutes, otherwise you get bored you know, after that. It, they're getting away from the Word of God. They're getting away from the Word of God. You can almost imagine this. Someone wrote this and said, imagine this, sitting in church. It's on a bright Sunday morning. The invocation was nice. The singing was nice. And you managed to stick an extra couple of dollars into the plate. Your pastor steps up to the pulpit, arranges his notes carefully, sips some water. He smiles warmly to the congregation, holds up his Bible, and he announces, before we begin, I should let you know that I have found the Bible to be too depressing and out of date. And then he grabs it and he throws it in a trash can. Can you imagine that? And they're doing that literally. They're doing that literally. Let me read to you what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall come, except there come a falling away, apostasia first. That falling away. Then Timothy For one says that in the latter times, that is the end, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Doctrines is teachings. Teachings of demons. When I was growing up, one of the teachings that that was very prevalent at that time was the prosperity teaching. And they would teach from the Word of God, and they'd tell you, we're in the Word of God. And they would take a verse like I just did now, but they would pull it out of context. It had nothing to do with what the whole context or even the book. Peter's talking about persecution and how he's encouraging the church through this persecution. That's what the whole book is about. Uh, In the first chapter, he's talking about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. So that when we suffer, we can have hope in Jesus. That's the whole reference. But somehow, they'll they'll find a, a word in here and they'll say, Money! See? God wants you rich. So in persecution, God wants you rich somehow. And somehow that persecution is happening to you so that you become rich. And I remember hearing these preachers talking about money, 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 money. And if you just give more, guess what? God will give you more. Of course, they're the ones living in the mansions and with the 
jets, you know, and all the vacation homes all over the world, you know, are in, and now are getting busted for it. I saw one guy, I think it was Kenneth Hagen. Um, literally, he took his whole church out to a, a landing strip to show off his jet to the whole church. This is what God has blessed me with, you know. That's crazy. And these people are believing it. Why? Because they're sitting there believing everything that someone says. I encourage you, don't believe me. Don't believe me. I don't want you to believe me. I want you to get into the Word and check it out as Romans ten seventeen. Be like the Bereans and see if these things are true or not. Be studiers. Read your Bible and see if it's saying what I'm telling you that it's saying. And if it's not, then don't believe it. Otherwise, you will be deceived just like these are deceived, many of them. And so there's this great falling away from the Word of God. Listen to this one man. He's a bishop. And he wrote a book about um, a reformation, a call to a new, a new reformation. What he's saying there is that what the church needs is something new. A new reformation. The old is just archaic. We no longer need it anymore. And a lot of people are buying into that. You know, there's surveys that are done and, and they're saying the churches are unable to reach the youth. Why? Because the churches are old and archaic. Is that true? Well, yeah, they're old and it is you know, it, of old times. But is it true that because we're teaching the Word of God that we are losing the youth? No, I don't think so. I think we need to get back to the Word of God. I think that those churches that are doing these surveys that are losing the youth are losing them because they don't see the uh, realness in them. They don't see the joy of the Lord. They don't see the Word really being taught and they're looking for reality. They're looking for sincerity in people's hearts. And there's a lot of fakeness going on around there. When you see a pastor going to a denomination and then the church just isn't growing and he decides, you know what? God's calling me to another church. And so he moves and another pastor comes in. And then it just continues to happen. What does that tell you? These guys are looking for a bigger church. They're looking for more money. You know, that's what it tells you. They're not satisfied where God has them. And so they keep jumping around until finally... And that's the whole key. I, I, a friend of mine was uh, an Assemblies God pastor. He goes, that's what we do. We start off in little churches. And then if we, we are liked, we, we will join a little bit bigger church and then a bigger church and hopefully we have thousands as we, we grow and we learn and become great at speaking and so forth. That's our whole purpose. It's a career. Where I believe God calls you to a location and I think it's scriptural. God calls you to a location and you die there. I've been here for 19 years serving in this ministry. A lot smaller than what it is now and this is still small. But it's not about the size of the church. It, it's about what God has called me to do. And so being faithful to what God's called you to do, to be faithful to teach the Word of God, and that's it. Whether it grows or not has nothing to do with it. What has God called me to do? Listen to what this guy said. And I'll just give you a few of his, his things. He wrote this book called his 12 Thesis. But I thought this was interesting. The biblical story of the perfect and finished creation, that is Adam and Eve. He says it's pre-Darwin mythology. So you know he believes in evolution. So he's saying creation, mythology. It's nonsense, is what he said. This is, a, this is a bishop of a church that believes this and is teaching this. The virgin birth, un understood as literal biology, makes Christ's divinity as traditionally understood. He said it's impossible. Well, of course it's impossible. That's what makes it a miracle. But they don't believe in miracles because those are impossible to happen. The cross, uh, the view of the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, barbaric. In fact, he says we need to dismiss it. There's no need for it. Really, that's what Christianity is all about. <laughs> Get rid of the cross. The resurrection. Now here's where the, the mysticism comes in. He believes the, the, the resurrection is an action of God. And so since it's an action of God, Jesus was raised into the meaning of God. What does that mean? I don't know. He was raised into the meaning of God. So the, the resurrection never happened. It was, it was more of a spiritual thing that took place. Yet he doesn't believe in miracles. But somehow he became the meaning of God and not physically 
resurrected from the dead. This is the garbage that's going on in the world today. Instead of just sticking with the word and teaching through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's what we do so we get a balance of what God is saying. Uh, you're not going to hear here a Joel Olstein a message, you know, a feel good type of message. You know, I'm not here to help you take your first step forward and become wealthy and prosperous in this world, as Joel Osteen tells you God wants you to be. You know, no, I'm here to just share what the Word of God says. And oftentimes, I struggle with it myself. I really do, because I'm reading it. And I'm like, okay, Lord, where's the hope there? <laughs> you know, here we are talking about the end of the world. It's like, where's the hope? Well, here's the hope. We don't have to be here for it. You know, we will be out of here if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There's the hope. Where's the love in that? Where's the love? Where's the positive thinking there? Here's positive thinking. Abide in Christ and your whole life will be governed by God Almighty who knows where you need to be at any given moment and He will bless you there. That's the hope. Get rid of sin. But, oh, we can't talk about sin because that offends people. We don't want to offend people. We need to talk about sin because it's sin that's keeping us from everything that God wants to give us. And if we don't get rid of the sin... We can't have the blessings. The Bible's clear on that. So, we need the truth. So what does Peter conclude here? At the last statement. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Uh, the word serious literally means be sober-minded. Be good stewards of what God has given to you. Don't be lackadaisical. Lackadaisical? You know, be serious about it. You know, there's a work to be done. Take the Bible seriously. Too often we're not reading it, we're not studying it, we're not taking the time to do godly things. We're not even thinking about godly things. We're just thinking about having fun. When can we go to Disneyland? Do you have yearly passes? You know, when can we do this? You know, there's work to be done. Our friends and neighbors are dying. They will be left behind while we are taken out of this world. We need to be serious about it and watchful because the Bible says He will come like a thief in the night. We don't know. So we need to be watching at all times and in prayer. And that word prayer is in the plural, so it's many prayers. Whether we're praying privately, whether we're praying publicly, whether we're on our knees or on our face, we need to be praying constantly. We need a lot more prayer to take place. Let me close. <clears throat> John the Baptist, who was a forerunner for Jesus Christ, he was preparing the way, he was taken into custody. And Jesus came to Galilee, and he was preaching the gospel of God. And this is what Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, it's imminent. It's coming real soon. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe in the gospel. Why hasn't God come back yet? Why has He been waiting? Well, for one reason, if He came back a hundred years ago, guess what? We wouldn't be in heaven. <laughs> so God is merciful in waiting, isn't He? He's gracious. And, and there's a few around you who still don't know the Lord. And He's being gracious. But it's up to us to take the opportunities to hand Him a track to share with them the gospel, to take them to go see the Son of God movie. I heard that it's good, and that people are crying as they're watching it. You know, to take them to see Noah and then explain to them, you, know, you have to care for people. That's why we're here in this community, because we care. We don't always measure up, but we care. Last week, this house across the street, there were like eight DEA cars all parked out there. Then police and so forth. And, and I came here to church and I was just like, Lord, what did we not do? I know that a couple of weeks earlier, somewhere over here, a guy came and visited on a Wednesday night. And he sat over on that side and he said, I came from across the street. But he didn't tell me where. Was he reaching out? Did we miss something? Because we miss things at those times you know, when we really need to be paying attention. And so we need to be ready and watchful and prayerful.